Welcome to all of you who are tuning in to ARPC online service. If you are joining us for the very first time on behalf of the church leaders, we warmly welcome you and hope you will be blessed by the singing and the preaching of God's Word. Let us begin by reading God's Word taken from Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Verse 15. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. This is God's word. I now pass the time to Wilfred and the music team to lead us in a time of singing praises to God. Good evening, ARPC. Allow me to read from 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it, it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Indeed, whatever circumstances we are in, whether our lives are currently smooth sailing or we are in a storm, we can all truly rejoice because the object of our faith and the source of our salvation is found in Christ. So please join us in praising our risen King, whose mercy never ceases and whose love never changes. Yes. 
shall Christ rejoice. Come young and old from every land, men and women of the faith. Come those with full or empty hands, find the riches of His grace. Over all the world His people sing, shore to shore we hear them call. The truth that Christ through every age, our God is all in all. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. Throughout the book of Exodus, we have been reminded of who God is. He is a God who is faithful to His promises, strong and mighty in delivering His people from bondage, and merciful even to a grumbling nation in the wilderness. Let us sing our next song together, His Mercy is More. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Patience would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood near the death we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Strong 
girl and darkness new every morn our sins say are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more thank you wilfred and the music team for leading us in the time of uh, singing praises to god indeed our sin, there are many, His mercy is more. Next, we come to the responsive reading. I shall read the first slide and uh, please uh, respond uh, with me. Uh, we, this passage is taken from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 16. First slide, please. All the congregation of the people of Israel move on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and came at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with a the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Together, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Many of us could be honestly asking, how long is this pandemic going to last? And that's weighing down on our hearts, on our minds, on our wellness, spiritually, mentally, relationally. But it's more important, not so much to get the answers to COVID-19, but to believe in the God of answers. Jesus, the Lord of history, the Lord of our story. And so, the precious lessons we've been learning from Exodus will take us to ERPC Annual Church Camp where we're dealing with the theme, viral chaos, but enduring lessons from God. So join us on Friday, June the 11, 8 p.m., Saturday, June the 12, also at 8 p.m., and Sunday in our services, where we'll climax with the highlight of this. There'll be special testimonies 
and there will be a special presentation by our guest artist, Colin Buchanan, bringing blessings to us, children, all the way to adults. So don't forget to register, mark your diaries for this. The next announcement has to do with our 2021 ACM. As for all organisations and churches, we are to have this virtually. And so mark your diaries that on Sunday, June 27 is our virtual ACM. We're going to look back in thanksgiving to God for protecting us through the year. We're going to look forward with assurance in our hearts that Jesus is Lord of His Church and we have the greatest reason to offer hope to family and friends who do not know Him. So join us for our ACM. The next announcement has to do with Mandarin Ministry. Mandarin Ministry is running a four-week Discovering Christianity course. We invite your Mandarin-speaking family and friends to join us. The course starts on Sunday, the 20th of June at 10.30am. To register, please contact Pastor Yak Chow. Our Missions Fellowship is organising Next Gen Missions, equipping the next generation to reach peoples for Christ. Christianity can often be viewed as a Western religion, but its roots are from Asia and the Middle East. In our next session of Next Gen Missions, Dr. Jerry Huang, lecturer at SBC, Singapore Bible College, and worships here at ARPC, will be showing us the neglected Asian aspects of the Bible and help us to read it faithfully and live it out vibrantly in our lives. So come and join us, 20th of June, 4 to 6 p.m. Again, it is online for now. Like to know how to handle, teach, and preach the Bible better? Pastor Chris Chow will be giving seven lectures as part of the equipped classes of Trinity Theological College, delivered online every Thursday, 8 p.m., from July 15 to August 26. Register at the correct link. In all these announcements, we ask for your prayers, we ask for your participation. Above all, we plead with God to mature in Christ and to continue His mission as we love one another. Thank you for joining us in our services. Pray that you'll be blessed in every way. Once again, a warm welcome if you are visiting us for the very first time. You may download our handbook from the website, as uh, you can see on the screen. Uh, in this handbook, you will know much about us, who we are, and also the programs and the events for the rest of the year. And also, there will be an uh, e-response card for you to be filling up. Uh, please do so and uh, send it back to us so that we can thank you for, for joining us. And if you have any questions to ask us, please, uh, you can uh, put it in the response card and we will respond to you as soon as possible. Thank you so much. We come now to our offering. Our offering is to give to God's workers to complete God's work. And so we ask for your joyful giving as members and regulars of ARPC. If you're new with us, please don't feel obliged to give. Just come and be blessed by the hearing of God's Word and the spiritual nuggets that speak to your heart about the Lord Jesus. Don't forget, for our members and our regulars, that we have been given a gift at ARPC at Tengah, a gazetted place of worship, and it's a different QR code and giving for that. May the Lord bless you as you step out in faith and obedience to be giving to His work generously and cheerfully. Amen. Now we have the congregational prayer. This prayer is firstly for myself and for all of us. Firstly, to confess our sins before God. For we need God's forgiveness more than anyone else. And then we will continue to pray for the COVID situation and also to pray for our leaders of our church. Come, let's go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Creator of the heavens and earth, the Alpha and Omega, Almighty God who is deserving of all praise and glory, You are the only true and holy God, and we bow before You in worship and prayer. We confess that we have sinned against You. We lay before You the deep and hidden sins of our pride and prejudice, our lack of love for you and for others. We know you see our sin far more clearly than we do. And against you, 
have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight? Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Purge us with hyssop and we shall be clean. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Create in each of us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within each of us. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Thank you, and thank you, Father, for the amazing grace that you have shown through our Lord Jesus. That while we were still your enemies, he died for us. May we live always for his honour and glory. We continue to commit the ongoing COVID situation into your loving hands, trusting in your sovereignty and purposes. We pray for the governments of all countries, including our own, leaders and administrators in the health sectors. We ask that you give them wisdom as they make difficult decisions to balance the various needs of the people. We ask that you will direct their hearts to do the utmost to save lives, protect the people, provide holistic care to the sick and caregivers, and to make good decisions for the sake of the people. We pray for the multitudes who continue to suffer in various ways due to, due to the pandemic, whether from being infected by the virus, having lost loved ones, being financially affected, or feeling the mental strain of adjusting to the new normal. We ask that, you, that your comfort be upon them. And for us, your people, to be a beacon of light and love, especially in these trying times. We pray also for our leaders in ARPC, our pastors, elders, deacons, DG leaders, children, church and youth leaders, leaders of various ministries and outreach. We ask that you would guide and direct them to love you with their whole beings, seeking the interests of others first and letting your light to shine before people that they may see your good works and give glory to you. We pray, Father, for Pastor Chris as he shares from your word later. May your word speak to him and grant him understanding. And pray for all of us who are listening in. May we listen to your word and allow your word to transform us from glory to glory, from grace to grace, and all for your glory. For this, Father, we pray in our Lord Jesus, most precious name. Amen. Scripture reading is taken from Exodus chapter 18, verses 1 to 27. Exodus chapter 18, verse 1. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God has done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord has brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershon, for he said, I have been the sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliza, for he said, The God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord has done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord has done to Israel in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, 
Blessed be the Lord who, had, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair, they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Verse 13. The next day, Moses sent to judge the people. And the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and His laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is no good, is not good. You and your people with you will certainly wear yourselves out. For the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. And now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. Verse 20, And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws, and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times, Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all these people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. This is the Word of God. Pastor Chris, please. Thank you, Elder Vaughan, for reading us God's Word, a very long passage of Scripture, but no matter how long or short, we are always blessed in the hearing and the doing of God's Word. On behalf of all of us here at the RPC, we welcome you joining us in our services. We're going through the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible. And what is it that we continue to hear from God? Let's begin by exploring the relationship between personal and collective, personal and collective experiences. And is there a relationship between personal and collective experiences? The early days of the internet, can you remember that? Early days of the internet and social media were very, very exciting. They were heady days, they were uplifting days. And um, with Facebook, it opened up a whole new world where you could share food, you could share birthdays, you could share holidays. And af but after a while, psychologists started to confirm more and more of what we were experiencing. And what did all these social media platforms, beginning with Facebook up to today, right, um, the different platforms that are there, what did it create? It started to create something unintentional, or was it intentional? Virtual envy or virtual jealousy. 
that looking at other people's food or restaurant outings, that looking at other people's friends and their parties, they always look cooler. Looking at other people's jokes, they always sounded funnier. Looking at other people's holidays, they seem more exotic. Looking at other people's photos and lives, they seem so much happier. They seem to have a charmed life, while my life seems pretty pedestrian and ordinary and routine and not colourful as theirs. And so there came, there came a widen, widening gap between what? A widening gap between our personal and other people's collective experiences. So this was the early, early days, and I'm bumping into a young pastor, and we we're just talking about phenomena of this. He's much younger than me, and he says, I, I, I tried, I tried. And I tried to do gospel work in there, but after a while, I, I, I spent so much time in a day, three, four hours, just, um, just too much effort, just too much effort to do so. But he was strong enough to do what? He was strong enough to bail out. He was strong enough to shut down his account. He chose not to be part of this global social media virtual envy experience. Now, not many people are as brave as him because you could call him a recluse, you could call him naive, you call, could call him innocent. Did you hear of a 20-year-old man here in Singapore who died after suffering severe burns when his personal mobility device, the PMD, burst into flames, very tragic. I could only picture that, only picture that. Him stuck in a lift and that burning away. People did come to help him, but the, by the time the Singapore Civil Defence SCDF came, he was already seriously, critically, fatally affected. He died. Then did you hear of 14-year-old Nuru Saz Sazli, who went out with his friends, the school holidays had just begun. <laughs> And while he was cycling, he got hit by a truck. And Noor Sazli, who was known to be a wonderful boy, just bringing joy all around him from his family and friends to his school, died from that crash. With such tragedies, what do we experience? With such tragedies that we read about out there, you think it's out there, it might happen to us. We, we are warned temporarily. We sympathize fleetingly. We may shake our heads. We may be moved in our heart. There may be a tear running down the corner of our eyes. We might visit the wake services. We might send condolences. But after a while, we forget. We move on. And it becomes someone personal experience. It's not mine or ours. That's not the case for God's people recorded for us in the book of Exodus. From this point onwards, everything that happens is both personal and collective and national. What happened to my neighbour happens to me. What happens to me happens to my neighbour. If you had an internet account during the time of Exodus, you couldn't choose to shut it down. You couldn't sh choose to shut down Pharaoh's decree that all Hebrew male-born will be drowned in the river Nile. You couldn't choose to shut that down. You can't say, oh, I don't want to know that. You can't choose to excuse yourself from the plagues. It will affect you. It affected Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and then he pounded on more suffering and more oppression upon God's people. You can't choose not to listen to the latest if you had an internet account or TV or some sort of thing connecting you to the world that Pharaoh now is hell-bent on killing you as you escape by God's grace. He's hell-bent on chasing you down. Their personal and national experience of God will now be no longer an exception. No one will be spared the dangers of living under a human oppressor. Yet no one in Israel will be exempted from the joys of being delivered. And that was Exodus chapter 15. Moses and Miriam, his sister, sing a song, what seemed to be an endless song of praise. By the end of the chapter, it turns to grumbling against God without end. What on earth happened between praising God without end to grumbling against God with no end. 
a few things happened to them, a few things became their personal and national experience that no one could exempt themselves from if you live during that time. By the time we come to Exodus 15 to 18, their main national experience of God came, to, came down to one word. Let me ask you, what's, what's the main national experience, global experience around the world with COVID-19? Fatigue, tiredness, the main national and personal experience of Israelites at that time revolve around the word testing. And how do we know this? Next slide comes on. There are four fatal dangers that Israel experiences in a relationship with God in five incidences here. There's no water at Marah, chapter 15, the end of the chapter. There's no water in the wilderness or the desert of sin. What an appropriate name, the desert or wilderness of sin. There's no water at Rephidim. And then they're going to face the Amalekites, their first external enemies, after being delivered from Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. And then there is internal implosion, and we'll take a look at that in a summary form. But all four dangers in the five incidences that Israelites face at that time in their relationship with God revolve around the issue of testing. And why is this so important? The big question is, what's the difference? What's the difference between God testing His people, Israel, and Israel testing God. And we found <coughs> there's a very huge difference. And so we plunge in to test number three. A repetition, as it were, because they face this one. Hopefully the slide comes on. So what's the difference between God testing us and us testing God? It's now going to be answered again. We said last week that the sermons in June are part of a series capping off what we've been studying as a church here in ARPC. What we're studying in our small groups called discipleship groups. And so we did chapter 15 to 16, Testing God, last week. Today we're doing Testing God. Uh, today we're doing chapter 17 to 18. We had DG celebration on Wednesday night, Testing God part two. And we're dealing with the four fatal dangers. But come with us to the climax, to the spiritual feast and highlight at our church camp, beginning on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And as a bonus, you can come and listen to Colin Buchanan share songs that usually touch young to old and wonderful testimonies of what it means to walk in faith and obedience to God. So that's it's just an advertorial that's there to keep whetting your appetite to come and listen to God's Word. For we believe with all of our hearts when you listen to God's Word, your life will be changed for eternity for the better. And so we pick it up from chapter 17, verse 1. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Verse 2. But the people were thirsty for, for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? If we've been following the storyline, at least in, in Exodus, this is the third time Israel grumbles against God's leader, Moses, about what? About the provision of water, food, and now water again. And as you read this, you could say, but actually it's quite understandable. These are the bare necessities of life. It's quite understandable. They were dying here at Mara. They were dying here in the desert of sin. They were dying here. We are dying here. When we use the word dying, right, in our modern day world, in first world countries, maybe like Singapore, right? This is not our first world complaint. Today, June, June the 5th, it's so hot, you can faint, can die la. But as we say that with a Singlish accent, can faint, can die la, you know you're not going to die because you're going to walk into an air-conditioned building, it's either your house or office or shopping centre, which can't go to a lot now, but almost all everywhere we go to, to escape the heat, we just walk into a, a place with a fan, a place with air conditioning. But what's happening here, the three incidences here, they could die. There's bare necessities of water and food and water, the third danger that they face, the second danger that they face, sorry. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? 
is a lot deeper. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, travelling from place to place as the Lord camped. Right? Camp at Rephidim, there was no water for the people to drink. They quarrelled Moses and, gave, and said, give us water to drink. But here's the thing. This is not an isolated grumble. By now, they have become serial grumblers against God. Because as you pick it up, the storyline from chapter 14 was their first national grumble. They said to Moses, as the army closed in on them, you brought us out to the desert to die. They say again in 1524 at Marah, the people grumble against Moses. And chapter 16, verse 3, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord. And now in chapter 17. So what does, what does Moses do? He does the only thing we see him doing. The people grumble against him humanly, horizontally. He turns upward, virtually to God. He turns to God, and Moses cried out to God, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. I do not know what kind of response you could be getting as a spiritual leader of Boys Brigade, Girls Brigade, what kind of response you could be getting in children's church, what kind of response you could be getting in discipleship group. But if you walk into a discipleship group that you lead and you find pockets of them grumbling against you, you know every time you lead this group of 10, 15 people, there'll be a group mumbling against your leadership. It might wear you down. This is not a few people mumbling or grumbling against Moses. This is the entire nation. The entire nation. We'll look at that later. So the Lord answered Moses, you go out in front of the people and this is what you do. You take some of the elders of Israel, take it in your hand, the staff, remember the staff? The staff that I first gave you to show to, Moses, to show to Pharaoh that it is me, Yahweh, who sent you. And what you have here is no small thing. It's the power of Yahweh, the true and living God. With which you struck the Nile, you go, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. You strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses, he hears God, thus says the Lord, he does what God says. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? The Lord was among them. The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. If ever there was a God who was with them 24-7, his name was Yahweh, the true and living God. But they were asked again and again. And so we introduced the idea last week, the four set truths when Israel, God's people, test God. When Israel, God's people, test God, a few things happen. Firstly, they forget God's past loving actions to them. They just sang the song of Moses and Miriam. The horse and rider fell into the sea. And once we are forgetful of God's love and power in our lives, we will question His presence in action in our life. Then secondly, Israel will put God on probation. They will withhold trust time and again on this journey in the wilderness, pending more evidence, give us more evidence that you are this God that you are with us, that you are among us. And what they were doing was something really serious. They were challenging God to prove Himself again and again. In the words of one commentator, he says, Israel's testing of God as seen here, our testing of God, in that sense, is deeply sinful. And this is what we must never do. And what is it we must never do? This is what God's people must never do. We must never associate, identify, and link God with what we call malevolence. Malevolence means is to think that God has evil intentions and evil intentions to harm us, evil intentions to hurt us, which underneath the grumbling against God's leader Moses was a grumble against God. So I just want to pause here to ask, as you walk through the circumstances of your life, the circumstances that pile on from day to day, the circumstances that pile on from year to year, have you perhaps simplistically reached the conclusion 
that God could be malevolent? And God's servants sent to serve you like Moses could be malevolent? There is nothing more serious for Israel's life than to charge God's leaders, Moses and Aaron, and to charge God finally with malevolence. You must never link and associate and conclude that evil comes from God, evil. The God who can arrange evil to accomplish His good purposes is different to the God that has evil attentions, intentions against the world and the people He created and the people He redeems. But you know what? As you read this account from chapter 15 onwards, indeed from chapter 14, the Exodus, what is it you must have spiritual discernment about? That God will bring circumstance upon circumstance that will make Him look malevolent. That is the problem. And so they say, I repeat, in chapter 14, were there no graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here to die? Chapter 15, verse 24, at Marah, what are we to drink? We are thirsting here, we are dying here. Chapter 16, verse 3, would that we have died by the hand of the Lord. How serious it is to, on the one hand, temporarily, sing that the hand of the Lord has delivered us and it's the same hand of the Lord that is now going to lead us to death. And so experience after experience, and now they arrive at Rephidim. Each incident keeps building up what? Each incident keeps building up circumstantial evidence that God, through His leaders and His servants, are against us. Remember years and years ago at the church camp, I came upon this and I shared that with you. Beware of force. Right? Beware of fear, sorry. Fear is false evidence appearing real. And for them, it was false evidence appearing real. No water means no God. No God means no good intentions against us. No food means no God. And if there is a God, no good intentions against us. Enemies, Amalekites attacking us, means no God, no way to fight against these enemies, means no good intention against us. I've got a complaint against my neighbour, chapter 18. They bring the bickerings between themselves and God cannot solve my dispute with my neighbour. So it's false evidence appearing real. And so we need to pause here, friends, because this is a gospel truth that runs from Genesis all the way to Re Revelation. The first person, the first being that came and spoke this false evidence appearing real was the serpent to Eve in the Garden of Eden. God has withheld the tree of good knowledge of good and evil from you. But when you partake of it, you will be like God. And she convinces her husband, Adam, and says, yes, I think the evidence is real. Why should God withhold something good from us? From that point onwards, we spiral into listening to the wrong voice speak into our life. So how does this end? I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. You strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders. He called the place Massah and Meribah, remember? And they still ask, is the Lord amongst us? This becomes Psalm 95 that we will deal with in the church camp when you join us. We'll plunge in to see how this looks like in the rest of the Bible leading up to its fulfilment in Christ Jesus, who is the second Moses, the final deliverer, delivering us from our ultimate enemies. And Psalm 95 is repeated in the New Testament. Massah and Meribah, the grumbling against God and the testing of God is a serious thing. And so, I'm not very good with technology, but because of this resurgence and what we call here in Singapore a heightened alert in which we had to scale back and go back from phase three when things were more open up, the economy and shops and interaction in schools, etc., we had to scale back. And so I decided to make one or two videos and hopefully we'll make a few more. And for me to learn how to make videos on my phone is a new thing. <laughs> 
So I made two and sent it out. Please forgive me for my amateur attitude, uh, amateur efforts at that. And I'm basically coined the thing, please, please go out there while you can and just walk. And there's so many beautiful parks in a small country like Singapore. Our, com our, com our government wants to build a park every 400 meters because they know it's good for our health and they will cut down our, our medical costs. And it's so important. So I call those videos, surround yourself with beauty. Surround yourself with beauty. And in doing one of those prayer walks and devotions to encourage you to go out there by yourself, with your wife, with your husband, with your children, just to soak in God through creation and read the Word of God and pray to God while you're out there. I remember the, one of the times I was walking when I was a young pastor at our founding church, Princep Street. I had gone to the nearest park there, Fort Canning, which is still a beautiful park. It's been renovated, done up. As I walked, I looked up. I was burdened by something as a young pastor. And I looked up and I looked at the beautiful trees, hundreds of years old, and the thought that came to my mind was something I repeated in the Surround Yourself with Beauty videos. You know, this tree, it has been here longer. And this tree has given more blessing, more shelter, more delight to the eyes, more feeding of the soul than my short life or your short life. Right? That tree has been there. Who planted that tree? It's a tree that, that God flourished what's the lesson here, friends? This tree has been here before us. But more importantly, as Moses stands there and listens to God and strikes the rock, there's a very important principle that starts to surface for the personal and national experience of Israelites in their walk with God. And what is that? As we face crisis after crisis, challenge after challenge, and it could be the bare necessities from we don't have water, we don't have food, we've got enemies, we've got quarrels. Always trust in God's eternal providence to face the temporary crisis of life. Before we experience our dangers and our needs, God has already prepared His provision. So how did that work out? Before they even arrived at Marah and started to grumble against Moses, God had already provided the 12 springs and 70 palms around the corner. Did He miraculously provide them overnight? He could have, but I bet you it was already there. But it was there beforehand, and God had purpose that one day, these 12 springs and 70 palms would feed my people passing through, en route from escape from Egypt into the Promised Land. Before we experience our dangers, before we experience our dire needs, God has already prepared His provision. Remember the manna? They complained the lack of food. And what was the manna? The quill. The quill, if you read it, right? Quills are, fly a migratory path. And they fly, and they fly by night. And they flop exhausted to the, to the ground. And when they flop exhausted to the ground, they become so easy for God's people to pick up. What on earth is this rock on the hill that Moses is commanded by God to stand on? And all of a sudden, as he strikes it, there's water from the underground flowing upwards. If we ask geologists, archaeologists, and scientists to go and check out this rock, it may have been there according to their signs for 10,000 years. There's a difference in carbon dating, but the point is not lost. God can turn nature into supernatural miracles. That's a lesser point, not a mood point, but the bigger spiritual truth is before we experience our dangers in life, before we experience our dire needs, God has already prepared that in advance for our provision, for our remedy. What do you call this God? The God of steadfast love. The ever-ready God, we say to some, sometimes we say, are you, are you ready to play badminton? Are you ready to play football? Oh no, I'm so old, I can't, I haven't jogged for, are you ready to swim 10 laps? And, but some of us who are fitter may say, I was born ready. God has always been ready to meet His people's needs. It's just round the corner. He's prepared it beforehand. 
But Israel just couldn't trust. And this continues to be their personal and national experience. That faith makes obedience possible. And obedience is the truest expression of faith. But Israel will always choose wrongly. She will always choose to listen to her circumstances speak louder than the voice of Yahweh. So what could God be waiting for you? I just want to linger with this with you for a while. Because you and me walk through life and I've made my mistakes of not being able to see God around the corner in my 40 years of walking and in my 30 years of pastoring. Sometimes fear, false evidence appearing real is more real than God. Let me ask you from God's perspective, there's a difference between what is real and what is true. Fear is very real. It's real. You experience it. Worry is very real. But fear is not true. Worry is not true. Because fear and worry does not come from God. It's only whatever God calls us to, that is true. God calls us to faith. Faith is true. And faith should be true and real. Fear is real, but it's not true. And we have to overcome it by increasing trust in God. Listening to Him, moment by moment, incident by incident, day by day, year by year, season by season. And that's what Israel had to learn personally and nationally. In that way, my friends, in that way, God is waiting for you and I to overcome your echo chamber of false evidence appearing real. You want to listen to people speak conspiracy against you, you will hear that. You want to listen to worries, you will hear that. You want to listen to grumbling, you will hear that. You just have to choose your theologians. You just have to choose your articles. You just have to choose the websites you want to go to, even Christian websites. Friends, God is asking you to listen to His pure word of the gospel. From Moses, the first deliverer, to Jesus, the final deliverer. God is waiting for you to overcome your echo chamber of fear. God is waiting for you to overcome building your own self-righteous case against God and against God's people who He may send to you, like a Moses to lead you through a crisis. God is waiting for you to overcome your premature conclusions about God and your mistaken conclusions about God. You believe that? That's what God was always doing with Israel. If only they would give willing worship to Him, willing surrender to Him, willing praise to Him, willing faith and obedience to Him, they would have unlocked God's gospel blessings upon them. And so the choice for them, right? The choice for them was always, sorry, yep, the choice for them was always to grumble or to obey. To grumble or to obey. Very sadly, Israel chose repeatedly to grumble her way, not into the promised land, but out of the promised land. And this is after, at this point in chapter 17, she chooses to grumble again at chapter 17. This is after she had experienced what? Personally and nationally, she experienced God's deliverance from Pharaoh. She, did, she experienced God's provision of water at Mara. She has experienced God's ex- provision of food at, in the desert of Sin. And after those three wonderful, miraculous del- deliverance from God, by God, they soften their heart. They harden their heart like Pharaoh. And so far from being distinctive from being the enemies of God, Pharaoh and man-made empires and man-made idolatries for our man-made securities, they were no different to Pharaoh and his idols. And that's why Masa and Meribah become a memorial to Israel's grumbling against God. Like I said, more at the church camp in the final three talks. We now have only time to summarize the next two dangers. The next two dangers they now face from chapter 17, verse, verse 8, verse 6 onwards. What do they face? The Amalekites. 
the Amalekites attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I, Moses, I will stand at the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands, always the staff of God, the staff of God. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses ordered. And Moses and Aaron and Hur, H-U-R, went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israel, Israelites were winning. Whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Malachites and Malachite army with sword. So when you read this, there's some, there's real danger. Have you ever been attacked? This is a battle. They've been attacked. And so the summary is, if the test of water at Mara and then at Massa and Mariba and of food, if the test was, can God the deliverer? Yes, okay, I, I consent. I agree, reluctantly. I, as an Israelite, agree that God is our deliverer. He delivered us from Pharaoh. Can God, the de deliverer, be also God, the provider? The provider of water, the provider of food? And that was answered in a stunning way, without a doubt, in chapter 15, 16, and the first part of chapter 17, recorded for us. If those were the questions, can God the deliverer be God the provider? Resounding yes. Now the question with the Malachites is, can God the deliverer, who is also the provider, be God the warrior? And the answer is, again, guess what? A resounding yes. But God will do it through faith and obedience. Moses has to go up to this hill, the top of the hill, he has to put his hands up and Aaron and her have to help him up and say, man, I didn't know of this wonderful principle. If I knew this as a football fan, every time my football club played, I would have put my hands up and Manchester United would not be so far bottom. Every time my son or my daughter played the game, I should have put my hands up and they would have won. Of course, this is a one-stop thing for them. But the lesson is important. They're coming to know more and more sides of God. Can God the deliverer be also be God the provider? Can God the provider be God the warrior? And the answer is a resounding yes. But there's no doubt the deliverance came divinely from God himself. If you caught the movie American Sniper, it tells the true story of Chris Carl. And Chris... Carl was of the special forces. He was sent to Iraq on four tours to fight the Taliban who were terrorizing the people. People of Afghanistan, different places. So the four tours that he went, he gained a name as the deadliest marksman in US military, military history with 255 kills. He was this lethal sniper. And snipers are very important when engaged in town-to-town, -town, village to village battles. You can't bomb out the enemies. You have to go in with your foot soldiers and fight them out. And without him, Chris Carl, they would not have won village after village after village. Chris was a Christian. And before he did anything, he would pray the same prayer again and again as he led his men, village after village, to rescue them from the terror, the horrors of the Taliban. You have the olden version. That's Moses and Joshua and Aaron and Hur against the Malachites. There is also the modern-day living version that any battle you, gain, you win against Satan, any battle you win against the world, any battle you win against sin is not something you could master up. He's divine from first to end. He's completely God. Completely God. 
And then we come to chapter 18. And we can only but summarize. In chapter 18, the brightest thing happens in Moses' life. His father-in-law visits him. Did you notice? Poor Moses, can I use the adjective poor Moses? Every day he wakes up, I told you, he faces national grumbling and the accusation of malevolence. I do not know. If you face this all the time, that you as a pastor of church got evil intent against us, you'll give up. Evil intent, I spend my days and my nights thinking about how to bless you as a church. What do I need to do from meeting to meeting, from day to day? And Moses faces this national grumbling. The first person who brings him any relief is his father-in-law, Jethro. And what is it the father-in-law says? What is it he says? He says something totally staggering. Jethro said, as Moses told him, fill in the gaps from the time he left Jethro's household to go back to Egypt to deliver his people. Jethro said, blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair, they dealt arrogantly with the people. Of all the people who know God, and there's a huge theme, a huge theme in the whole book of Exodus, remember? When God appeared to Moses, I don't know you. And then he sent to tell the people, they don't know you. And then he's tell, he's, he sent to, to tell Pharaoh, Pharaoh doesn't know God. The Egyptians will not know God. But the one person who is described as knowing God is Jethro. And could it be that Jethro, in some way mysterious to us, unknown to us, was now sharing infant faith in the same God, Yahweh? I just read J.S. Bright. J.S. Bright, The Faith of Israel, is a book worth getting. It's a classic book, a classic commentary with history and archaeology. And I chased down this thing that they found that the Midianites, somewhere in their history, right, they built tents like tabernacles, temporary places of worship, and they found statues of their idols thrown out, desecrated. And they found there a relic of the serpent that Moses will hold up for Israel to look at. And could that have been a sign that the Midianites never know? But here we see Jethro. And as he comes, he brings good advice to Moses. This is the first time Moses listens to, thus says the Lord, thus says my father-in-law. And what does he say? The people come and they bring grumblings against each other. The fourth danger is no longer water or food, the external enemies. The fourth danger is internal bickering between themselves. And this will be alluded to in a huge way in Exodus chapter 20, when God gives the law. What is the law? The first four commandments, their relationship with God. The next six commandments, all the way, is governing their relationship with neighbour. You shall love the Lord your God with all the heart and mind and soul and love your neighbour as yourself. So do not, do not, you must honour your father and mother. That's human and horizontal. You do not commit adultery. You do not bring false testimony against your neighbour. You do not murder. And ultimately, in the Ten Commandments, you do not envy anything of your neighbour. This initial record of the disputes that Moses now had to bear would not be soft. Remember the numbers were 600,000 men? Maybe a million of them with women and children and grumbling every day. And Jethro says to him, the father-in-law, you can't do this. You can't do this by yourself. You, this is the first organizational chart for Israel. And he says, you've got to do this, you've got to do this to get your leaders, right? And take, take them, and some will look after the thousands, the hundreds, the fifties, down to the tens, and that's how you do it. The big things you, you look after. And some would take this and say, this is a blueprint for organizing church. It's very interesting. The New Testament never goes back to this for how we should organize ourselves. But they do organize, and there's goodness in that. And what is the goodness? 
There's the goodness that Moses is not the singular leader with Moses, uh, with, with Aaron, and they organize it. But we must understand, after, even after they organize it, the problems of their heart against God and against each other is never resolved. But the good thing is, there's something to practice. So how do we practice here in the RPC? I was just reading the ACM reports in preparation for our ACM. In any one week, we have about 180 of our children's church teachers teaching our children online, in class before. 120 leaders, discipleship group leaders teaching faithfully. Then you extend it to the boys brigade, the girls brigade. Surely it's not something that I do by myself or the pastoral team can do. And then when we do this with, with the guest workers, yes, we started it. I started because the, the word came to me first. Then I got Pastor Lam Young to help me. And with every single thing that we have done, it's just doing this together. But the important thing not to miss is Jethro stands out. How well do we know this God? You know, Psalm 95 that we'll look at. Psalm 95 verse 10 says this. For 40 years, I, Yahweh, loathed that generation, hated that generation, and said, there are people who go astray in their heart. They have not. What do you think is the next word? For 40 years, God hated this people who in their hearts have gone astray from Him, and they have not. Can you guess at the next word? It's a verb. And they have not known His ways. The word know is a very huge word. It's not conceptual knowledge. It's not theoretical knowledge. It's not knowing creeds. It's not the hand-me-down faith of your father and mother. It's the personal relationship with God fed by the reading of His Word and the hearing of His voice. And specifically for Israel was to increasingly hear more and more decrees, more and more commands that will come to crystallization in Exodus chapter 50 in the Ten Commandments. So what lessons can we learn? There is no such thing as the untrustworthy God. The truest expression of faith is obedience, we said that. And faith God makes obedience. There's no such thing, sorry, the word is missing, as the untrustworthy God. And there is no such thing as untested people. There is no such thing as untested faith. If you claim to know this God, He's totally trustworthy, but your faith and my faith in Him will be tested again and again. And that's very important. And when we're tested again and again, it's completely beyond us. The circumstances are completely beyond us of food, of water, of enemies, of these fights that I have with my neighbour all the time. Just ask the lawyers. Just ask the MPs. What is it they saw from week to week, from month to month, from year to year that weighs them down? And these things are completely beyond us and makes us completely dependent on Jesus. And so we have to choose, thus says the Lord, or thus says Pharaoh, or thus say our circumstances, or thus says finally, the Lord in Jesus. That Jesus has come to save us from the greatest oppressor, Satan, and the greatest oppression and the greatest slavery, slavery to sin and slavery to the fear of sin, the fear of death in our life. From that, you and I have no rescue. I do not know what circumstances you face that are beyond you to overcome in your personal and your collective experience. Mona got a call one night, Mona, my wife, and she went in to help a troubled marriage. I couldn't go. It was a woman who called her, a sister in Christ who called her. As Mona walked in through the door, this sister in Christ was at the window. I think one leg out of the window. So Mona ran up to where she was and held her and grabbed her and basically said to her, this is not the way. This is not God's way to solve your problem. 
It's not God's way to solve your problem. Come down. Thankfully, she came down. Thankfully, she come down as Mona spoke Jesus in the gospel to her. And thankfully, the husband was willing to come for counseling. And thankfully, through a period of time, just in listening to Jesus speak the forgiveness word, the reconciliation word, the freedom from oppression word, the freedom from slavery word, the freedom from sin word, brought hope to their life. Did it happen overnight? No. Did it take a lot of time and effort? Yes. Did it burden us? Yes. More marriages have been sorted out at our home than anything else. Is it tiring? Yes. Is it hopeless? No. And so we have to choose, friends. Thus says the Lord. He's now spoken through His Word. The Word become flesh, His Son. This can now be our personal experience and this is now the collective experience because the call of God is no longer to save one nation, Israel, but to save all nations as we go with the glorious gospel. So listen to this and respond with faith and obedience. I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to sing a closing song of Jesus being the cornerstone and we must believe in this. And after that song, I'm going to close in benediction and give you two things that I want you to pray through and work through for this week in your walk with God. Let's pray together. Whatever our personal and collective experiences, we thank you that your word tells us you're calling us to know you and to experience you in life so that the last word in our life will not be of oppression by Satan, oppression by sin, that our last word in our life will not be fear, false evidence appearing real, that we are so prone to listen to that the last word and experience in our life will be faith and obedience, unlocking and availing to us the blessings you promised to Abraham, the blessings that you carried on through Moses to his people, the blessings now availed to us through Jesus and Jesus alone. By your grace and by your spirit, lead us to listen to Jesus and help us to overcome everything that stands in the way, that faith and obedience will be our truest experience of life unto your glory, now and forevermore. Amen. In closing, let us sing of Christ, our cornerstone, our true hope that strengthens us in the midst of the storm, for he is the Lord of all. Weak man.
made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found. Righteousness alone, fall as to stand before the throne, fall as to stand before the throne, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Holy Ghost, the benediction, which is a prayer asking for God's protection over our faith. Just two questions for us to work through. And why is this so important? Because we do not want to promote a Christianity. We do not want to preach and live a gospel. It's only true for the weekend on Saturday and Sunday, but not true from Monday for the rest of the week. We want to believe in a God who is at work in our hearts, in our homes, whether we are discipling together or whether you're discipling at home, whether we are churching together or churching at home. So the two questions for us to reflect, pray, by yourselves, with your spouses, with your children, with your brother or sister in Christ through the week. Firstly, what are some of your triggers? Triggering, what are some triggers triggering you to F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real, and leading you to conclude that God or His people could be evil. What are some false evidences appearing real, leading you to conclude that God or His people are malevolent? Secondly, what practical steps can you take to replace false evidences appearing real, to replace false evidence appearing real with faith expressed in obedience? May you pray about this Speak to God, turn to Jesus, read His Word, fellowship with other people, and grow in this way. Let's turn to God in closing prayer. Now may the love of God our Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ alone, the abiding and mighty presence of the Holy Spirit, keep us in the mighty and tender love of God through Christ forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all for joining us in our ministries. And we as God's people call the church. We exist to help you in your journey. So you can contact us and in different platforms, we'll try to respond to you. We pray for our nation. We pray for things to resume and for us to be able to meet up again. But before then, until then, the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. <laughs>